Okay, everybody, Larry Lawton here for another great show. I got Franklin. Actually, I got his name is Sean uh, Fontana, Fontano, uh, also known as Solo. And uh, Solo's going to be my guest today. He's with GTA. He's been there since 2003, I think. Uh, and we're going to have a great show here. Before I get started, check us out on YouTube, member programs, Patreon, Discord, fan servers. Everybody knows about my book that goes nuts. It's gone nuts and movies are being talked about and everything else. So we're having a lot of fun doing this now. Well, welcome to the show, Sean. What's up, Larry, man? Thanks for having me, bro. You know, uh, listen, I, my, my fans have been wanting you. And, and, you know, I just started GTA. Not started, I mean, you know, maybe six months ago, eight months ago, a year, whatever it was. I do a lot of... Uh, like, you know, reviewing the game and stuff like that. And, and I talked to, obviously, uh, uh, Jay. So, and, and you guys are characters that I got to know. I mean, it's pretty cool stuff. I mean, you know, and we're going to get into that. Because I want to know about your life. You got an interesting life, Sean. And, and I think it's a great life. It's a success story in my mind. Uh, you are a former gang member. Uh, or, obviously, you come from the streets, you know. We both have the similar backgrounds. You know, we come from the streets. We come from, I guess, hard knocks, if you want to call it that. Uh, and, and we didn't let it knock us down, you know. Oh, yeah. Most definitely, man. Tell me a little bit about your your, your, your childhood, or your, your growing up, or your how that started. Um, yeah, man. You know, I, I grew up in the city of uh, Watts in Los Angeles, man. And it's like one of, if not the worst part of like Los Angeles County. And um, I grew up and I was raised in the projects and it was called the Nixon Garden Projects. I grew up without a father, you know what I'm saying? Um, my father was in the penitentiary all his life, so I never knew him. And the crazy part about it is um, when I finally got to meet him, um, it was on his deathbed. He had got into a, a he was a, a bank rock. And, and I actually saw the shooting, that's what's so crazy man i was i was like 12 year old 13 and i was cleaning up a church's chicken which is a chicken place you know a parking lot and i saw the police high speed chase and i saw the car crash and the shootout and i never even knew that that was my father until my mom took me to the hospital but before they pulled the plug on it you know and uh she was like that was your father and then i found out that was him in the shootout and I was the first and pretty much close to the last time I've only seen him. Wow, that, that's deep. I know Watts, obviously. I, I come from the uh, Rodney King era. You know, I remember all of that. I remember how, how it was back yeah. in those days. I'm not a young kid either. You know, it's funny. Your story, it, it really hits home to me a little bit. And it's a tough one. because you, But you, you got through it. But we're going to go into it. Like, I lost my nephew the same way. My nephew was 24. He got shot right in the head in the drug game and right in Philadelphia. And he was right in the middle of the wow. street, two shots right in the head, 24. Just wow. saw him a week before he visited me in prison. I was in prison at the time. This is 2004. And I told him, Davey, get out of the game, man. You know, look at your uncle, you know. I was very close with him. And boom, he, got, he gets killed, you know, and it, it hurt, man. It hurt a lot, you know, and, and I know you didn't know your dad, but that had to have an impact on you. Obviously, you come from the streets. So how did you get in the drug, uh, uh, the gang game? Well, you know, I, I, like I said, man, I was raised without really my parents. My grandmother raised me. So, you know, I was able to do what I wanted to do as a kid. So at the age of about 13, I started gang banging. I finally jumped off the porch and started gang banging. And I, you know, I ran with a with a vicious crowd, man. And I didn't know they was that vicious, you know, when they were taking me on shootouts and all this crazy shit. You know, I dropped out of uh, school in the ninth grade and I started counting money for this guy that was a big time, you know, drug dealer. So, I mean, I was counting tons and tons of money as a kid, you know, 14, 15 year old, and I'm coming to school and I got 50,000 and 30,000 in my pocket of just counting money for these dudes, you know what I'm saying? So it, it was, you know, they say, if you hang around five millionaires, it's more than likely you will be number six. I was hanging around all drug dealers and gang members. So, I mean, go figure, you know what I'm saying? So 
you know, it, it was easy for me to fall into it. And then at the age of, I want to say, I, I got also got a book coming out too called Game Changer, man. And it's, it's crazy about my life story. We're going to have to have you on when that comes out too. Yeah, please, brother, please, because it's deep, man. And I want to get you a copy way before it, you know. Oh, I'd love to, man. I'll, and I'll be sending you mine too. Oh, yeah, definitely. I need it, man. I, I read about you and did my history on you. But yeah, man, you know, at about the age of 18, 17, 18, Man, I had a whole shitload of money, man. I bought my mom her first house when I was 17, you know. Wow. I bought my first house when I was 18. And I ended up buying more property because, you know, it was easy to get in the drug game when the crack era hit. When the crack era hit, that's pretty much all we had in the community, in the in the hoods. And it was easy for us to set up shop anywhere, you know what I'm saying? You can set up shop at your cousin house, your auntie house, your mama's friend house, and it would be lines and lines of people that was hooked on drugs, man. And I'm talking about, it was like a a revolving line of making so much money. So at that age, I had like three or four of them, you know what I'm saying? So when I got a little bit older, I met this this dude, man, from a whole nother country. I don't really want to say, but you know what I'm getting that, man, to where it was easy for me to get what I needed to push to the big dogs, you know what I'm saying? And I, I still didn't know what I was doing, you know what I'm saying? And he was dropping shit loads of this shit on me, man. So at the end of the day, man, it was like, you know, you got the gift of the money, but the curse started coming. I started getting into a lot of shit, man. I, people, people just see me as this character, but they don't understand. And it's in my book, man, that I've been through two kidnappings. I've been shot five times. I've been in and out of jail. I've never been to prison, but I've been in and out of jail. You know, I always had bail money and lawyer money. So then was the two things I was taught by an older guy. You make sure you always got them two things. That's right. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I've been shot uh, five times, man. I've been shot in the stomach twice. A bullet hit, one of the bullet hit the bottom of the ground and ricocheted through my skull, through the back, my leg, and both of my arms, right here and right here. And these came from after the guy shot me in the stomach twice. He stood over my face and I went like this. So he shot into my arms. It's all part of the, the game. It comes with the territory. My wife, who I've been with right now for 25 years married, she's been kidnapped because of this shit. My son, my oldest son, his his mama been kidnapped because of this shit. So I know what it felt like to get the phone call saying, hey, you want to spend some money for your girl? You know what I'm saying? So I, I, I it's, it's a... It's a it's a feeling that it's a phone call no one wants to expect if you love this person, you know. You, you know, Sean, that that's so. I, I was shot. I was stabbed twice, shot, and and I know those feelings, the adrenaline, the pump, the you know, it's survival mode. I mean, you're in total survival mode. People don't get that unless they've been through it. Uh, obviously, you were a young guy when that happened. How old were you when that happened? When I got shot, I was eighteen. And then I can remember, man, one thing I can remember, man, this in my book, man, and I tell everybody this. I can remember it was a hospital called Martin Luther King Hospital. It was the only hospital that was saving trauma. And it was in the middle of the ghetto. And all they were specializing head shots, stomach shots, you know, just gun wounds. And they were saving us. But they had stapled you up. You didn't get stitches. So they just fix you real fast, put staples in you, and get you up out of here. They saved your life. Yeah, trauma center. Yeah, yeah. So I can remember going in the hospital, man, and I can remember me just praying and praying and saying, Lord, please don't let me go like this. I can never forget this, man. As tough as I was, you always going to resort to whatever you believe in and start, you know, I don't care who it is you believe in, you're going to start saying, please, not like this. I'm too young. So I can remember this doctor, man. He was a, a like a Ghana, like kind of African kind of doctor. And he kept telling me to shut the fuck up, shut up, shut up. And I was like, you know, in so much pain, I was just, Lord, Lord, please don't let me go like this. And he said, do you love your God? And I said, yeah. I was testifying, you know. I didn't know what he was asking me. I was just, yes, yes, yes. He said, well, go to him then if you love him that much. If not, shut up and let me do my job. And it just, it was so freaky that he said that. And then I couldn't take, um, I couldn't take the, back then they was giving you the gas to knock you out. I couldn't do it because I was allergic to it. So they laid my arms out on a cross and they strapped, they strapped them both down where they couldn't move. And an acupuncture doctor came in and started sticking me and sticking me. And all of a sudden I couldn't move no more. He paralyzed me. And I could not move, but I can 
I couldn't talk, but I can see. And I'm trying to tell him I can't breathe. I'm about to die. You know, I'm thinking I'm going to die. But I ended up falling asleep, waking up, and my life was saved. I'm here today on, on Larry's show, man. So, well, you, you sh Wow, Sean. The, so that happened. Is that when you got out of the game? Nope. When did you? I mean, you're 18. You just was shot up. You're making money, buying houses. Listen, I know that fast cash. I had millions and millions. And, and I get it. Oh, it's a power trip. People, you know, you tell people, today we tell people, you know, you don't realize it. All the money is not going to make you happy. There's other things that will make you happy. Don't get me wrong. We all got to make money. We got to do our thing. But it's not the ultimate. You know, when you have it, it's easy to say. But you tell a kid who comes from where we come from, hey, you don't need money to be happy. Bullshit, motherfucker. You got that money. Who are you kidding? You know, and I get that. What brought you out of the game, or at what point did you get out of the game? To be honest with you, man, the point that made me really, really, really leave the, the, the drug game was after the second kidnapping. You know, it was just like... When was the first? When was the first? Like The first was, let me see, I had to have been 22. So you were making money, a lot of money at this point, from 18, 20, you know, 17, 17, 18, 20... You, you, you can't, you're banking, man. But you're living large. You're spending your girls and clubs and everything in the world. I know how that goes. Yeah. And, Very cars, all those things. And now you're 22. Your first wife or girl gets kidnapped. Yeah. Did you pay a ransom? No. No. It, it ended up, my godfather, He's a he was a real street legend. A very, very strong street legend, man. He ended up, after the guy called back again, telling me where to bring the money to, I was more in a rage. I didn't want to give no money. I was like, just tell me where the fuck I need to come. I was going to take more than some money. Sure. Looking at, to blow somebody motherfucking head off. So fourth time he called and my God uncle, he snatched the phone from me. Now, he was a real, real reputable guy in these streets, man. I'm talking about when I say reputable. I got it. Street creds out the yin, man. Oh, my God. Beyond beyond what you can say. So he picked the phone up and he said, he asked, who was this? And the guys didn't tell him. And he told him who he was. He said, since y'all don't want to talk, I'm going to tell you who I am. We don't get his niece back in the next hour. He going to find out because he pretty much said, I got a dial in area of where you're telling us to drop the money off to. You pretty, because back then, if you're telling somebody to drop the money off in the Nickerson Gardens, it's pretty much the guys that did it is from the Nickerson Gardens. So you understand that. So he pretty much told them what he had to tell them. And he hung the phone up in their face. They was trying to talk and he hung the phone up in their face. They called the phone back. He told me, do not answer. They called back again. He told me, do not answer. So I was like, man, I'm going to take the money, man. I'm going to take the money and I'm going to deal with it how I got to deal with it when I get me. Whoever pick it up, they going to have a problem. We're going to grab them. So my brother ended up sliding in the back seat of the car with his bulletproof vest on. I got mine on. We got our pistols and we ride to go over there. I pull up to where they told me to throw the money out. They said, throw it out and just drive off. I just sat there for a long time. And then I ended up looking to my right and there was a guy sitting on the ground. But he looked like a hobo. He was real bummy looking, but he was a Hispanic guy. So I kept looking and I kept looking. And I looked to the left and I said, you know what? I'm going to throw anything out. So I just threw a, a shoebox, like with some other paper bags, out the window to see who come get it. I'm looking over here at him. It was a, two guys jumped off the roof of the house where I was sitting on the street, grabbed the bag and jumped back over the gate. And when they did that, the guy that was sitting over here, he jumped up and said, he was an undercover police. I never even knew it. Wow. I didn't even, hey, look, I didn't even know my grandmother called the police. So they followed me. They came cars from everywhere, helicopters. They caught them two guys. But still, I didn't even know that after my uncle said what he said, the guy, the guy that had, that was with her already told her, get up, come on. Just don't look at me. She, she said, he just kept saying, don't look at me. Please, just don't look at me. And put her in the car and told her to look out the window that way. And he said he won't look at her. And he dropped her off. He then just dropped her off and got rid of her. But I never knew that. I was here waiting to get somebody ass. I was trying to get into some problems. 
but I never even knew that they let him go, you know. So I, that's how we ended up getting her back. You know, she she got brought back. My uncle went and picked her up. So now, now that incident happens. You're still not out of the game. You see, now the cop, the cops got those guys. They got two of the guys. Did they come after you? Because you know you were packing. No, they didn't. They didn't bother me. The crazy part about it, though, Larry, is the next the next day. No, the same evening. They said we're gonna walk you in here because we want to see if you know these guys. So I I never forget. It was at 108 police um, station. They told me to put my hands behind my back and they were gonna act like they had me handcuffed. And they said we're gonna walk you past these two guys. They had them standing up against the wall, handcuffed. And they said we just want you to get a good look at them and we're gonna walk on past with you. So I said okay, okay, that sounds like cool. Come on, you know I'm crazy as a motherfucker at this time and I'm mad. They walking me, I got my hand behind my head. There's two of them walking me. It was a white guy and it was a younger kind of like, he was mixed kind of like, like he was Dominican or something. So we walking and I see these two guys with their heads down doing like this, like shaking their heads, standing up. And they got me real close to them and they, and they told me where they was going to be at, the two guys standing up. I got real close and I was looking and I was looking and I was looking and I didn't know him and I, one of them had his head down and I was trying to look up under there. And when I looked, he looked at me and I just grabbed him in his throat. And they, we all on the ground, everybody on the ground. So they cussing me out and cussing me out and I didn't give a fuck. I was like, I don't give a fuck. Arrest me, so what? But they ended up letting me go. And then the day after that, the guy that was, the, the cop that was walking me on the right side, man, he came to my son's mother house and gave me the two guys' names. I never forget him to this day. Wow. So I figured everything out after that. Who were you with? Can you say who were you gangbanging with? I was with the Crips. Okay, the Crips. Okay. So, um, so you don't like my shirt? Oh no, it's cool. Ah, bro. I'm only kidding you, Sean. I'm only kidding, bro. <laughs> so you gotta remember this, man. This is what a lot of people don't understand. Is gang banging is when I grew up in it. It was Crips versus Bloods, which was which when you get our age, you know, you get older, you say this shit is stupid. A, a big time, right? It was predominantly the murders and the, the, the violence was Crips on Crips and Bloods on Bloods. Oh, the, the different streets and stuff like that they had up there. Different right. streets. But it, it all stems from two things, and you know this. Money, the crack spots, territory, and women. You know, that's life. That's in everything in life, just about. I mean, I don't mean drugs. It's money, business, uh, or women, or uh, you know, sex, or women, or something. Something gonna fuck somebody up, man, over something stupid too. It could be the stupidest thing in the world. You know, we we talked about that with the mob. You'd see two mob families getting like heated, or but the most killings was the Columbos when they had the Columbo Wars in '92. They're killing each other. Twelve guys got killed. So I mean, it was you know just crazy, but it's fucking nuts. And then, you know, it's this, it, everybody got this myth about once you in, you can't leave unless you death, blood. That's a fucking lie. You can leave when you want to leave. If, and especially if you, somebody of that nature and you was, you was a well-known kind of guy, a, what we call them steppers, you know, that didn't, that didn't play no games. And I was a stepper. I didn't, I didn't care who you was. I didn't, I, I didn't fear you. I didn't care how tall, how wide, how much money you had, who you were. I did not care because I, when from a kid, man, I was raised by a, an abusive stepfather. And it's in my book again, Game Changer. He, he used to beat me so much, man. And I just never understood why did I get beat every day, like two times a day till my mama used to have to come home and say, why are you finna whoop him again? I got him. I got it this time. Go upstairs. Tell me to go upstairs. And she started whooping on the dresser and told me to fake like I'm crying because mm -hmm. she knew the abuse was just too much, but she couldn't tell him. Or she would get abused. Or, or yeah, she would get abused. Yeah. Come to find out, you know, he, I'm giving a lot of the book up, but it's cool. You know, you deserve it. Your show is here. He died of a heroin overdose when I was eight. And I walked in on it and I watched it. And he was trying to reach for the phone and I kicked the phone out the way. Hey. I can't, I can't knock you, Sean. He taught me hate at a young age. And I blame this man to this day for who I am. He taught me how to be numb. He beat the, he beat the, um, the caring. 
He he beat the compassion out of you. He beat the compassion yeah, out of you. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, man. So he made me be like a stone person. Like I didn't mind, I didn't mind doing this. I didn't I wasn't scared to take it. You feel what I'm saying? Absolutely. I didn't fear it. Like somebody would can pull a gun on me and I and I I wouldn't run. Don't get me wrong, I don't want to get shot. But I would go at him. I would lunge at him more than run. And I don't know why I'm like that, man. I'm like a, I'm like a pet bull. Like I want to just fight, and fight. You know, I'm. I, I got that same gene in me. It's like if something happens, I go to it, and I want to fight. I want to do something. And I, I think that comes from abuse. Of, when I was abused as a kid, and a lot of little things that you just now you don't give a fuck. You know, you got that. Fuck you. Okay, I die. You know, and it's a crazy mentality. Obviously, we're older and we're a lot wiser and stuff, as I always tell people. So it's at that point we start saying, looking back at our lives and say, what the fuck were we doing, man? I mean, it was nothing to shoot up a house, shoot up a cop's house. She didn't give a fuck. I mean, and I think back, I says, how am I alive? I've been stabbed. I've been shot. I've been in more situations than I can even count. And, and it's like, holy fuck. Fuck, I mean, and I, I just think about it. Either I should have been in life sentence or I should have been dead. But I'm here, I'm happy, and I'm actually interviewing you. And, and this is, we got some great questions now. So now, you get in Rockstar, or Rockstar, how do you get this gig that is, let's face it, man. G, uh, listen, I did so much research on GTA and Rockstar and everything else. They're the, they're the Mac Daddy. They're the biggest game, most sold game. I can go on and on and on. Your character is great. I mean, when I played, I said, okay, I'll be Franklin. And I didn't know you. I said, this is great now. And how did you become, did you audition for it? Give us the, the backstory of that. That happened, man, from a guy named DJ Poop. He's a he's a well known. Yeah, he's a, he's a director, I think, or something, isn't he? A director yeah, of movies. He's a director. He's a big direct director. He wrote the movie. Um, um, he co-wrote the movie with Ice Cube Friday. He wrote Three Strikes, the movie. He wrote The Wash, and he wrote Grow House. And I was in every all of them except Friday. He's my friend, and how I met him, man, was a we were getting into it when we were younger. And we end up being real good friends. And he's not only a great director, he's a great producer, man. He produced any rapper you name from the West Coast, he's had his hands tied to. Dr. Dre, Snoop, whoever, whoever, whoever. Yeah, I, I, I did see when I was looking you up, Snoop was in a lot of the movies with you. Yeah. Snoop, uh, Dre was in it, a couple others I saw. I said, oh man, check him out. I said, this is in these movies, it's pretty cool. And they're pretty cool plots, you know, the one with the car wash. I said, pretty good shit, man. You know, I mean, I was, fat. I was fat being too. Yeah, I saw it, man. You're a big dude. It's fuck. <laughs> so, um, yeah, DJ Pooh, man, he called me one day, man. I was part of a motorcycle club, man. We wore the packs called the Choppers. I was the vice president, and it was some heavy hitters in that club, too. My new stepfather, who my mother remarried, ended up, he was the president of this club. So um, I was out riding on my motorcycle that day, and DJ Pooh called me, and he's like, man, I got another gig for you, man. You might want to come up here, man. It's for a video game. And I was like, man, I don't want to be in no damn video game, man. I don't, I don't care about that. Because I, I, I did it before for him, for um, San Andreas, Grand Theft Auto. I was a, I was a few game voices in there. I just right, right. I did read that. I did read that. Because your, co your cousin is in him, CJ. Your cousin is... is yeah, yeah, he play, yeah, he play CJ. Yeah. So he called me and I went up there, man. I went on, went up there, man, and I rode my bike up there, making all this noise and doing woolies and stuff. And so all these British people were standing outside when I was going through there. I got off and they said, "Come on, come on." They pulled me past a few other people and they got me up in there because Pooh was like, "That's my boy right there." I was telling y'all about. So they walked me up in there. I sat at the table, did the audition. It was like they gave me a script. I looked it over real quick. And I was like, all right, let's go. And I did it in my own words. I didn't even stick to their script because it was part of some robbery type stuff. And I was, I just went off the head. So they was like, God damn, okay. They like shook my hand and said, you know, 
if we like you, we'll be calling you. All right, don't worry about it, shit. If y'all don't call me, I don't care because I'm still in the streets. Now, by this time, bro, I was in the streets still, but not in the drug game. I was in a whole nother game, man. It was kind of close to what you went to jail for. Money. I was taking what yeah, I wanted I at this you. time. Yeah, I, and I had a crew. Yeah. And yeah. I had a crew. I had a solid crew, man. We were... If we wanted it, we coming to get it. I hear you. That was my game. That was my I game. I remember man. my wife kept saying, if you get away from these guys, I'm telling you, I had this, I got this this thing that things are going to open up for you in a great positive way. You just have to walk away from everything. And it, I was like, shit. And an incident happened right after I did the audition and I escaped it. The law. I escaped it. So I got a call about the art, second audition, and I said, damn, they calling me back. It was a British guy, and he was like, hey, mate, um, we want a, you to come back for a second, you know, roundabout, and we want you to come to Santa Monica this time. Okay, I'll be there. Click. Went back again. Ten days after that, I get a phone call, man. How would you like to be in a video game? Now, you got to remember, at this time, they were telling us the video game was called Paradise. They never said Grand Theft Auto, so I wasn't too geeked up about it. And I never did motion capture stuff, so I didn't know how to video to make a video game. I thought I was just going in a booth and read some lines, and that was it. I think uh, Jay told us that they, they 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 wire you up for stuff like that. You're actually character. Yeah, man. Yeah, they put um, they, you put this scuba diving suit on. So when I got there, I signed the contract. I, I got the second gig, and I found out I got the gig. It was a total another name. So I wasn't taking it too serious. If I'd have heard it was Grant Del Fado, I would have. Thank you, Lord, all this. So I'm in New York now. Um, they had me staying in um, Lower East Side off of, at a Thompson Hotel, a real nice hotel. But they had picked me up in the morning and take me to Glen Cove, Long Island to work in this big old warehouse. When I got there, they was like, go put this suit on. I'm like, what the fuck is this? You know, I'm thinking I'm going to go in the studio. So they give me this tight, tight, tight scuba diving suit. Now, you got to remember, I was about 250 some 260 at this time. So so I go in there and I zip up in this suit. So I'm like, what the hell, man? I was like, man, I ain't going out there like this because there's a lot of people looking. I said, I thought we was going to go in the studio. So next thing you know, I said, fuck it, man. I'm, I'm going to try it out. I go and they start putting these balls all over these markers. And I was just like, oh, man, I didn't know this shit would be like this. So I actually quit. I said, man, I don't want to do this. Tore it off. I'm going home. I'm going back home. They talked to me. Please, please, please. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So they called one of the owners. He came down. He sat at breakfast time the next day and talked to me. He said, come on, man. You're going to want to do this. Just trust me. They still ain't telling me this Grand Theft Auto. I didn't find out it was Grand Theft Auto until like a year later after him. Oh, wow. Yeah, bro. So now, why? What did they do that on purpose? Keep it under wraps for you? It's a purpose to keep it under wraps, man, because they know we might would have slipped. Even though we signed in DNAs, come on, man. You part yeah. of Grand Theft Auto? You gonna be like, hey, I'm in Grand Theft Auto. Yeah, no shit. It's the biggest game in the world. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I end up staying, man, and thank God I did because it ended up being. It, it was my breaking point to pull away from everything I did because it kept me working. Now, you got to remember when I first went, it was 2009, late 2009. That's when I first started. And we worked on the game for like four years straight. And it came out in 2013. So you, but you were, oh, you only did the small bits, the voice bits in, in GTA 4. Yeah. So you oh, did. Dre. Right. That was San Andreas. You you did the GTA five. It took four years for them to do you. It took about four years complete with the filming, because everything that you see the characters do, me, Jay Clay, uh, Stephen Ogg, uh, Ned Luke and the rest of the people that's in the game. You really have to do this. Everything you see Franklin doing, I had to do it. I had to fight. I had to kick i had to run fast i had to jump i had to every acting part you see we really had to act it out and you got to remember man they can give you a, a three-page script one two three and you have to remember all your lines from all three right and they say and action and we walk in so what's up y'all so what we doing and then uh jay jay might run his lines okay so we're going to do this heist and 
blah, 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 blah. And then Ned Luke might be like, okay, yeah, yeah. And then I got to come in. So, I mean, how are we going to do it? And then I might be like, fuck, I messed up, man. They like, cut. <laughs> they make you start. They make you start all over again. They want it, they want it clean all the way through. You cannot mess up. Now, in a movie, real movies, you can run, run, run and mess up. And then say, cut, pick it up from right there and keep going. Man, we was getting to the point we was on. And uh, take number 75 and action. <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, I I learned that when I interviewed Jay about how they actually, like, you know, look them up. But reading into your stuff a little bit in your past, man, I, I hate to say this because I never want to say it ever condescending in any way. I'm proud of you, man. To get out of that game, I know how hard it is, you know. I mean, I'm really, I really give you a lot of props, bro, because I know, I know how easy it is for me to get back in the game. And I give you such props. You know, doing GTA for you, and then sticking with it, because you know, fuck you, I know I can make more money than this shit, I can do this, I can do that, but you stuck with it. So I think that's awesome. Let me jump into some questions. They saved my life, man. I owe GTA, man. I owe Rockstar Games, man. They, and I just got to say this before we move to the question. They saved my life, man, and I, and, and, and that's why I stay, I stay loyal to them, man. I do. Because they, they gave me a whole narrative of being a taxpayer now, being a real citizen of legal money, and staying out of all the trouble that I know. Because like you said, man, everything that we've done to get money, it's like a method or a crack, or a heroin, or a cocaine user, it's so easy to relapse. So easy. Because it just calls you. Like, to this day, bro, I can fall asleep and have dreams about how I was getting that money, and it could call me. So I just I just give them, man, a little bit of praise, and I thank y'all for picking me, you know what I'm saying? Oh, and I, I really I appreciate you, you know, uh, uh, thanking me for that, man. Well, well I, I just think it's an amazing thing you did. Let me jump into some questions. I got a ton. What was your first impression when meeting Ned Luke and Steven Ogg? Oh, man. Ned Luke, man. Ned was kind of a cocky dude, man. He was kind of like he knew everything. You know, he was real cocky, man. And it kind of irritated me. <laughs> But me and him, me and him end up turning out to be the best of friends when it comes to us three and the whole um, GTA crew. Me and Ned, we have too much, nothing alike, but me and him grew together as like brothers for real. Like that's my brother, man. That's my big brother. So when I need some questions about the business part of GTA or just any kind of business, he got knowledge of the acting game. He knows SAG after he know contracts. He know all that type of stuff. So yeah, that's he's been my help with that part. Yeah, so that's the two differences. What was your hardest mission to act in the story mode? The hardest mission, man. It was a mission with me and Ned. Again, me and Ned. It was that was the what hardest mission. What mission was it? It was the mission remember? when I found out. Yeah, when I found out that. That, that he was uh, an undercover, like he worked it with the police. And I don't, I don't know if a lot of people that know the game, they know when I found out that he um, ratted out uh, Trevor, that scene and that mission was so hard that it was hard for us to do. But when we finally nailed it, Ned was crying because I had a hard time acting. I couldn't act. I, I'm not an actor. It was just so happy Rockstar was giving me roles that I damn near done did before. So it was like, you know, you got to remember Rockstar was giving me lines saying, hey, mate, and this. I said, bro, I don't say fucking mate and this and that. And I don't say motherfucker. I say motherfucker. You know what I'm saying? That's what made it so real. That's what made your character, you and Lamar. When you guys fucking had me so cracking up. You go rob a car. These fucking guys are so real. Whoever did this or wrote it, I, but now that I know, you guys did it yourself. You know, you guys actually did it yourselves. And that's what made it so cool. And I really respect that. If you could change one thing about Franklin, what would it be? Easy. I can easily answer this, man. If y'all notice it, the people that play the game noticed that Franklin, I used to get this a lot, Franklin wasn't tough. 
He wasn't tough, but he wasn't a punk, but he just wasn't tough. So I had to endure a lot of being bullied by Trevor, being told what to do by Mike. By Lamar. Lamar just pushing me around in a way like a, a little brother, but a hard head little brother. Like, I got this. Watch out. Get your ass off. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember that mode too. Sure. They, they wrote Franklin in a soft way, and I wanted to be harder. But after you start looking at the storyline, Franklin was the 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 middleman to everybody. Think about it. When you look at it, I was always in between Michael and Trevor. Chill out, y'all. You know, we got to get this mission done. I was always in between trying to tame Lamar. I was always Lester's go-to guy when it's time to put hits. So my storyline was actually very, very, very important in the game. You know what I'm saying? Oh, a- absolutely. I told you, you're the first one I... Besides Michael, when it comes out with the first thing, you were the first one. I mean, obviously, the game opens with Michael and that thing. But after that, it's you. It's pretty much you. I mean, look, you, you it. And you can't kill me. You can't kill me at the end. So that say a lot about Franklin. You know what That's saying? true. Do people recognize you? All the time, man. Even with the mask on, this is crazy. Even with the mask on, man, they, 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 they hear my voice, right? I could be in a place and I could talk and I could see people just like, I could see like if I'm making an order, I can see their face kind of like, and then they'll walk off and then they'll come back. And then next thing you know, one of them will finally say, hey, uh, cause they're going to back. I, I'll be watching them. They be working in a in a sandwich place, man. And they get their phone off and I can see them Google. Yeah. And then they ask me, and then I'll be like, first I'll play with them. I'll be like, hey, hell no, man video game man me nah hell no nah, man i'm a construction worker you know i play with him <laughs> but then but then you know i'll be like man have you ever played grand theft auto man i'm the franklin character and once i wake some of their brains up because it's now you gotta remember it's been seven years so once i reinvent myself and say and they're like i knew that voice sound familiar man and next thing you know they want pictures and autographs and i love it man you know i love being some uh, an iconic video game actor. Yeah, 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 but then it's a good feeling. It's like, wow, you know, people really like what you're doing, and and I think that's a pretty cool thing. How did it feel to get confirmation that you were going to be the video game? Like at that moment, they said they called you back that final time and said you're in. Well, I think you answered it because you because you said you didn't know it was GTA. Yeah, but the moment I found out that. I was going to be a playable character, Franklin, and it was Grand Theft Auto. It was it, it was the weirdest, but the best feeling in the world. I couldn't even sleep that night, man. I just stayed up all night just staring at the ceiling, man, just being thankful, you know, that I'm going to be part of something that's so iconic. Now, I didn't know it was going to be this big, but I knew it was going to be big. Yeah, I, well, I was just very thankful. You know, I like what you said, and I really appreciate that. What you appreciated, Rockstar, because they helped and saved your life, they, and and that's a great statement. Yeah. What you said. Uh, how fun was it recording with the other guys, like with with Jay and and Og and all those guys? Was it fun? I mean, did you guys enjoy the time? You were together a long time filming that, right? Yeah, it was real fun, bro. It was real fun because Jay was funny, man. Man, me and Jay, we hung out off the set. He's a fun guy too. Yeah, he's a very fun guy, man. He's he real cool dude, man. And uh, it was easy working with him. You know what I'm saying? Because he he let me be me. The hardest person it was to work with was the Trevor character. It was hard working with him because he's Trevor was always just wild and crazy. So. In the real life, I would have I would have punched him in his guy's mouth. You know what I'm saying? So, so I had to be here. So I had to I had to I had to take that. I had to accept it and let him kind of punk me. You know, like the scene when he fell over the gate, and I was laughing, and he was like, "You laughing at me?" And I was like, "No, nah, man, it was cool, man. All right, all right. I'm sorry. You know, come on, man. In real yeah. life, come on, Larry, man. So that's what I'm telling you that." When they first wrote it and he tripped over the gate and I was laughing at him and 
he said, you laughing at me? Ah, blah, blah, blah. In the, in the first scene, I was like, you ain't gonna do shit. I'll knock your ass out. They was like, cut, cut, cut. They was like, no, Solo, you have to let him be this. So that's what I was talking about, how they just kept saying, calm down, Solo. You got to let this person be the bigger person. Here's a good one. Is it difficult after such an iconic role to do other stuff acting-wise? Or is it just open the doors? It really opened the door for me, but... To be honest with you, Larry, man, let me tell you, man, I, I, I regret it to this day. I didn't take advantage of it because I never wanted to be an actor, man. You know, me being a street dude for so long, it was hard for me to just go and start reading, casting when I, 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 feel you. When, yeah. when I could have. I could have because everybody else, they benefited from it. Stephen All, uh, the Lamar character. A whole lot of the other extras, they benefited from it. And I had people calling me saying, can you come to this cast? Can you come to do this? Can you come do that? And I was just like... Do you have an agent? You never got one? Yeah, see, an agent would open the doors, put your ass in. But, you know, you and I, and, and I don't have one either. Matter of fact, I had one in the beginning where I said, get the fuck out of here, man. I couldn't deal with that shit. But I get it. I, I really feel for you because I get it. It's our, it's our wild lifestyle. That's if you know. No, man, I'll do it. I do, and we know we can't do it. You know, we can't do it all, and that's the thing. Even though GTA has become a staple in the gaming for a long time, was he was he expecting the total of sales to be as big as they were? I mean, I believe they're the highest ever. And what's his reaction to GTA still being played heavily today? So many years after the initial release. I mean, is it boggling your mind? You know the numbers I read, you know, I think I read where they made six billion dollars. Six billion dollars. It's at it's at nine now. Fucking nine billion dollars. Think of that. I mean that's, that's mind boggling. I mean, I had no idea Rockstar was such a big company until I did research. Uh, and obviously, you know, well worth it. They did a lot. They put a lot of money into it to make the game. But think about you. I mean, you're in a game that's made nine billion dollars. Movies come come close to that, you know. And uh, and it's still strong. But it's an amazing feeling, man, just to know that my name, my likeness, will be tied to that forever. You know what I'm saying? You know what? Uh, that's a great way to look at it. And I, I even look at all the stuff I do. Yes, you're 100% right. Now things are, and in our case, in my case, I was known as the bad guy, you know, robbing all the money, doing all the shit, you know, bad guy, beating, tortured a person, did a lot of bad things. I'm not proud. Of. Now I'm, it's good stuff. You know, you're trying to help people. You're in the, you got your channel. You, you know, I'm a big, you know, I'm big in prison reform. Uh, you know, I think we need to fix the prison system. I think too many minorities, too many people of, of lower economic status is like we were, you know, we, we don't have, we didn't have the stuff and these kids today get fucked over so much and the system's broke. I mean, I was there. I wanted to thank you again for coming on. You've been great. I really appreciate all your help uh, doing this. I hope, you know, you enjoyed it and I think we're going to stay in touch, I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure, sure we'll stay in yeah, touch. Yeah, yeah, you solid, man. You a solid dude, man. We got each other's numbers. Absolutely. I'm calling you, man. Anything you need, I'll text you. You can send me your info, the other info, so I can send you stuff. Your, I got your emails. You need anything, Sean. You need anything I can do for you, obviously. You just, I'm a text away, bro. And and I mean that. I'm going to start calling you big bro. There you go, man. A big street bro. <laughs> That's right. That's right, man. Hey, have a great day. Make sure you did right. I really appreciate all, all, your, all your coming on, and I really wish you the best of luck with what you're doing in this. All right, man. I appreciate it, man. I want everybody to go to my social media, man, my Instagram at Solo118, and my Twitter is Sean Fontino, and my Facebook is Sean Solo Fontino. And we're going to put these in the links below. We're going to have them in the links of this video in below. Everybody will be able to take care of that. Have a great day, everybody. That Here is the great Sean Fontano, solo, and we all know him as Franklin. Thanks again, man. I really appreciate it. Have a great day, brother.